Hello class, welcome back to my channel and today we will discuss about the internal controls of cash. Before we can enumerate and define the internal controls, let us first talk about inherent risk. Inherent risk is the susceptibility of the nature of the account itself towards misstatement or fraud. There are some assets which have higher inherent risks than others, one of which is our topic which is cash. Cash has a higher inherent risk as compared to other assets because of its form as well as the volume of transactions it covers. So for cash, when you take it literally, it's easy to put cash into your pocket, embezzle it, and then run away, right? So as compared to your equipment, of course, you can put such a large equipment inside your pocket and then uh, hide it somewhere, right? It's not that easy to hide as compared to cash. So that's one reason. Another reason is that because of the volume of transactions, there is this tendency that there may be omissions, transposition errors, and other kinds of misstatements that can be committed against cash. So in order for us to avoid these misstatements or even more so fraud, we establish internal controls. In relation to the inherent risk, internal controls are meant to combat or minimize these inherent risks. Controls are meant to safeguard these assets from misstatements as well as fraud situations. And there are many examples of internal controls relating to cash. The first example is segregation of duties. Our mnemonic here is ARRC. Duties involving authorization, recording, reconciliation, as well as custody shouldn't be assigned to the same person. What do you think would happen if only one person is given the authority to approve a transaction as well as record it. This means that he can make up transactions, he can approve those transactions, and he can just record it as valid transactions, which can cause so many problems like overstate the balance of cash or understate it. Another example would be what would happen if both custody as well as recording responsibilities are given to one person. Then, the person who is holding cash can just record any sort of disbursement and then that particular amount, he can just disburse it as his own because it was already recorded and settled in the books. The second example is impress system. The impress system requires that all cash receipts should be deposited intact and all cash disbursements should be made through checks. We have implemented this system in our church. In order for the leaders in our church to easily verify the amount of tithes per week, the whole amount of tithes in that particular week, which we counted on a Sunday, is deposited the next day as a whole on the bank. In this manner, the particular amount of deposit will be reflected and inputted in our passbook. We can also prepare a voucher or a check that will serve as our budget for this week's disbursement. In this manner, we can see clearly in the passbook itself the inflows of our tithes weekly as well as disbursements. At least in the bank, it is verified that indeed a particular amount went in or out of our account. But of course, if you have disbursements that have a very low amount, like for miscellaneous expenses, then the company can also establish what we call a petty cash fund, which will be our next topic in the next video. The next internal control is bank reconciliation. Often, there may be differences arising between the cash balance recorded in our books and the cash balance recorded in our banks. The differences between the book balance and the bank balance will be discussed in our next video once again. The next internal control is lockbox accounts. A lockbox is rented for a fee and customers are advised to remit their payments directly to the lockbox account. Without the lockbox, it will take a long time for us to receive collections from our customers because they need to deliver a check, we need to deliver the check to the bank. It will take a few days before that check is particularly cleared, especially for customers that are coming from abroad. For lockbox account, it eliminates this problem or at least minimizes it in such a significant amount of time because it reduces your collection dates by assigning a lockbox in a particular bank in the area of the customer so that the customer can just deposit the cash itself to your particular lockbox account. At the end of the day, whatever has been collected in your lockbox account will be 
counted and deposited within the day. So it's very efficient, right? But of course, it's not free. When you plan to establish your lockbox account, you need to pay a certain fee per month. We can conduct a cost-benefit analysis whether the cost of paying for a lockbox account is worth it when we compare it to the amount of days that we will be reduced in our collection cycle. The next internal control is voucher system. A voucher is prepared for every cash disbursement to ensure that each disbursement is properly authorized. Voucher is made and requested by a particular department which requires a disbursement. It can be from the purchasing department of our inventory. It can be a department requesting for repairs in our equipment department or even our admin if they want us to pay cash to buy supplies. So whichever department requires disbursements or purchases of any kind, then they will prepare a particular voucher. This voucher will then be submitted to one particular department which is assigned to approve the transactions. So in order for the voucher to be approved, not only will these requesting departments pass the voucher, but they will also attach supporting documents such as invoice, purchase order, or even delivery receipt. So this will ensure that these disbursements are really valid. So once they are authorized, then these vouchers will then be stamped as paid after a check has been prepared to settle this particular voucher. A voucher is often a pre-numbered system. It leaves us with what we call an audit trail or you can compare it as if you are following something and there are breadcrumbs along the way so you can follow the path well because the voucher will show us what is the reason behind the disbursement when it is approved, when was the check issued, and for whom was the check, and for what purpose, and all other details that are important to our disbursement transactions. The last example of internal control is cash counts. Cash counts are periodic or surprise cash counts that can be conducted in order to ensure that the cash balance indicated per books is indeed the same as the amount of cash in our safe, in our vault, or even in our petty cash box. I have tried this during my audit days. I tried observing cash counts uh, for our client, uh, which is a bank. And it turns out that the balance in their particular cash count is different from their balance in their books. So the next question is, what caused these differences? It could be a mistake in recounting. So we recounted again, and then it turns out that it's still the same. And then upon investigation, of course, it's not automatically a misstatement. It's merely a deviation when there is a difference between the cash count balance and the book balance. But after the investigation, we found out that, oh, it's because some of this cash has been already deposited to their headquarters or to another office, which was properly accounted for. So that's the use of cash count. It ensures that the record that we have in terms of our cash balance is the same as our actual cash amount that we hold. It's more effective when it's surprise because often when it's periodic, there are loopholes because fraudsters can just supply a temporary amount of physical cash to match the book balance. So it's better if cash counts are conducted as a surprise cash count. When we conduct cash counts, there are issues that can rise up. In particular, there can be either cash shortage or cash overage. When the cash counted is less than the book balance, then there is cash shortage. Take note that our balance here, quote unquote, is the actual cash count because we literally see the cash that we are holding. To record the cash shortage, we will use a suspense account and we will debit that as cash shortage, this suspense account, and credit cash on hand. Take note that this suspense account will really not appear in the financial statement throughout the internal audit or external audit period. These suspense accounts will be eliminated depending on why this cash shortage happened. It can be because it was the fault of employee. If that's the case, then the employee must pay the missing cash. Cash shortage will then be eliminated. It will now be credited and a receivable from employee will be debited. However, if the investigation was without merit, then this cash shortage is eliminated and because our cash balance decreased, it will be accounted for as a loss. Another issue that can rise up is cash overage when our cash counted is greater than the book balance. This means that our physical cash is bigger. Just like cash shortage, we will record the overage amount as a suspense account. We will debit cash on hand to increase our book balance and credit 
cash overage. Now, we will investigate once again why our cash count is bigger than the initial book balance. If we settled that the reason for cash count is for personal money for employee was mixed up with our money, we will eliminate that cash overage, debit cash overage, and we will credit payable to employee. But if it was without merit, then we will deem that the cash overage will still be eliminated, it will be debited, gain simply will be recorded and credited in our journal entries.